If you've been building applications in ASP.NET, you've probably come across Mediator at some point in your travels. There are plenty of other content creators talking about how they're using Mediator in their ASP.NET Core web apps in order to have different pieces communicate with each other. So like I was showing in my last video, which if you haven't watched, I'll link it right up here for you to watch and then come right back. We were talking about the Mediator design pattern and how that allowed for different pieces of a system to communicate with each other without necessarily being coupled to each other. There's effectively a man in the middle, which is the mediator, and this allows for the different parts of the system to talk to that man in the middle, which then talks to the other parts of the system. In this video, we're going to look at the NuGet package mediator, which is really popular for being able to support this type of communication pattern. And a quick reminder before I jump over to Visual Studio is to check out my weekly software engineering newsletter. It's totally free, no strings attached, and I'll have a link in the pinned comment below. All right, let's check out some code. On my screen, I have a sample application that's using Mediator to build effectively what we saw in the last video. And if you haven't gone and watched that yet, it's a really, really simple chat room or chat group application. It's very contrived, so it's not something that's going to run over the network currently, but it allows us to add several users, which you can see right here, register them onto this registrar, and then from there, they're able to communicate with each other. And we're going to explain how this all works. But before I jump into this particular code, I want to show you the NuGet packages that you're going to need to use to do this. So I've just gone ahead and opened up the CS proj file to show you these different NuGet package references. And I wanted to take a moment to call out that if you go looking up this information online, I've noticed that there's a handful of articles and different Stack Overflow posts that have some of this information incorrect. So we only need these two NuGet packages in particular if we're building a console application or something that's not necessarily ASP.NET Core that we want to have Mediator hooked up for. So in order to get Mediator hooked up, we need Mediator itself. So we're going to reference that NuGet package. Depending on when you're watching this video, there might be other versions available for you. And the other thing that we're going to need to leverage is the Microsoft extensions for dependency injection. If you're using ASP.NET Core, I believe that you get all the dependency injection stuff you need right out of the box, and you likely only need this NuGet package. However, because I'm going to demonstrate this in a console application, I just want to call out that you're going to want to have both of these. All right, so heading back over to the program, I just want to show you that we need to wire up some dependencies how all of that looks, and then we're going to walk through the different implementations that we need with Mediator. So the different sections of the program that I have sectioned out with this console write line just to be able to see on the console what's going on. First of all, we're going to create this service collection. And if you're familiar with the dependency injection framework in Microsoft, I don't really need to explain this part to you. However, we are going to have a message handler and a registrar that we're working with. And we're going to dive into those in just a moment. But the part in particular that we need to make sure we're doing is adding this mediator service configuration. And what I was mentioning just a little bit earlier is some of the information online is incorrect for this. In fact, if you go ahead and ask ChatGPT, like I tried doing, you're going to notice that it's giving you incorrect recommendations unless you keep poking and prodding it. And that's because this add mediator method seems to have changed. Previously, it was just taking in this parameter right here and we call the method just like this. However, that's not the case anymore and I'm not sure what version that changed in, but we're able to get the same thing that we need just by having this syntax here from line nine to 12. At this point, once we've executed all of this code, we end up having a service collection that's created for us and we're able to resolve those services. So in the next part, I'm getting all of the different pieces that we need to put this all together. So I'm going to ask for an I mediator, which is created thanks to the mediator NuGet package. And then I'm going to resolve these two classes here. And I'm going to have to explain these to you in a little bit more detail, which we'll do in just a moment. But these are the classes that we're making for this particular program to run. Once we resolve these three services that we need to work with, we're going to go ahead and create three different users. And because this is just a contrived example, we could do two users up to 10 users or whatever number of users we want to work with. And then we need to register them onto this user registrar. And in just a moment, like I said, I'll explain what this part does and I'll come back and re-explain this very briefly. The last part of our program here is just going to send out the messages and we'll see what happens when the receivers end up dealing with those. Okay, so first I wanna start with the user registrar because I mentioned that we needed to register users, but we didn't really explain what was happening with them. This user registrar is just something to maintain state for us. And we're going to see in just a moment, but when we're dealing with Mediator, the state of the handler that we have isn't maintained. And that's going to make more sense in just a moment. So the sole purpose of this user registrar class is just to keep track of the different users in our system. 
That's it. It's super simple. And then we have a property to expose that so other people can see that. So in our example that we just looked at, that means we're going to be adding three different users into here through this method. And then when we ask for the collection of users, we'll be able to get all three back. Okay, so what does a chat user look like? Well, the chat user is going to take in an iMediator reference as well as a name that we want to give it. And again, just a quick reminder that our chat users are not going to be talking directly to each other. That's more like an observable pattern or something else where we have direct coupling to the things that want to communicate. In our particular instance, we want to talk through a mediator. So the chat users don't know about each other. There's no coupling to the particular type that they want to send to, and all that they know is how to communicate with the mediator. The mediator is the only API they have to communicate with, and the mediator handles that communication on their behalf. So when we jump back to the code, I hope that clarifies it a little bit more. That's why each user doesn't have a reference to all the other users. It's talking through the mediator. All right, with our mediator reference, we can check out this send message method that we have. And all that we're going to be doing is taking in some text and then creating this data transfer object that has the name, so our name as the sender, as well as the message that we want to send. And from there, just like I mentioned, all that we're going to be doing is communicating through the mediator. And the chat user itself also has this receive message implementation. And the receive message implementation allows us to handle messages that come from the mediator. So when the mediator receives a message, what it's able to do from there is delegate that out to the correct receivers. Because our application is just a little simulated chat room or a little group chat, that means that when we send a message, it's going to get broadcast to all the other users that are attached to the registrar. So we have a couple of pieces that we've looked at. The chat users themselves, as well as the registrar where they're registered to. But how does the mediator come into play here, and what was the other class that we were looking at? Well, the last class that we have to look at is the iRequest Handler implementation that we've created, and that's called Chat Message Handler. I left a comment here because this is incredibly important when you're working with mediator to understand how this behaves. This particular message handler, when we wire it up with mediator, is going to create a new instance every single time it wants to handle a message. And that means that this class cannot have any state. So, so I want you to pause and think for a moment because this class is supposed to handle the chat messages. And that would mean that if it's handling a message, it's supposed to be able to delegate that out to the other users. How could it possibly do that if it can't maintain a state of all of the users, if it's not allowed to have any state? Well, fortunately, our nifty user registrar is the thing that we created to do that for us. So that means that every time one of these handlers is created, we will get a reference to that user registrar. Registrar. Because this user registrar is hooked up as a single instance, that means that every single time we create one of these chat message handlers through Mediator, we will get that same user registrar instance. And I added a console write line here so that when we go to run this, you can see that in fact, it will create a new chat message handler every single time that we send a message. So quick recap, this chat message handler is created per message that gets sent. It cannot have state. And as a result, we need to move the state into some other dependency that we can have automatically passed in through the dependency injection framework. Now, the method that this class needs to implement according to the interface is this handle method. It takes in the chat message that we're going to be sending from our chat users and has a cancellation token as well. Again, if you watch in the previous video, what we were able to do is loop through the user registrar. And for each user that's in there, we end up broadcasting this message out to that user. The only thing that we're doing here is skipping over the sender. And I mentioned in the previous video, and I'll mention it here as well, that this is a little bit silly. We probably wouldn't want to restore restrict people from having the same name. Instead, we would probably want to check if the IDs or something were the same on the user. So um, this is a little bit of a hack here, but just a heads up that that's why we're ignoring the sender when we go to broadcast this message out. And then we're going to call that receive message method that we looked at a little bit earlier. We pass in the content of the message as well as who it came from. And I'm also going to call out that I added a couple console write lines so that when we read through this example at the end, we can see all of the behavior coming together. Now, a quick note, if you wanted different behavior for your chat application, or you needed to handle messages differently, this is the spot in the code in essentially your message handler that you're going to want to change and update according to your rules. That's because the chat users themselves are not responsible for communicating with each other, but they need to be able to talk to this message handler in order to have that routed accordingly. Okay, so before we go and look at the output of this, I just want to quickly skim over this one more time so we can understand it. But I'm going to start right from here where we're registering users onto the services that we need. So we're going to ask for the mediator here on line 16, and that's going to be the reference that we pass into each chat user to communicate with. 
Now we register this chat message handler above, and it's already essentially hooked up with the iMediator thanks to the Mediator NuGet package. So in fact, if we click on this and we look at where it's highlighted, there is no use of this. We actually, we in fact don't need to have this included at all. And that's because, if you recall what I said a little bit earlier, when we send messages from chat users, and that goes into the Mediator, that mediator will instantiate a new handler every single time, and we will see that in the output. But the final thing that we do need to resolve here is on line 17, that's the user registrar. And if you recall, I was saying that because we are creating that message handler every single time, we need to have something that can maintain the state. That something is our user registrar. It tracks all of the users for us, so that message handler, when it's automatically constructed through the dependency injection framework, will get this instance, and all of these three users that get registered on here will be available to our handler. And I know you want to see the output of this, so let me press play and let's step through it. All right, so no exceptions, which is great news, and if we start from the top, we can see that we're creating the services. That wasn't too special, but that's that service collection work we had to do. Then from there, we're going to be registering the users. And the first part of that is resolving those dependencies that we did in the first step when we were creating the service. Next, we're going to send that first message. And you can see right after that, we are constructing a chat message handler. And I want you to pay attention because we're gonna create another one of these after we send the second message. From there, Mediator is going to enter that message handler. And this is another console write line that I added. And we can see that when we're sending the first message, which came from user one, that only user two and user three are handling it. The text that's added here where it says user one and hello everyone is passed along as that chat message. And right after that, we can see that we're exiting the message handler. And that was sending the first message. So let's check out the second, which right here says sending second message. And like I said, we're going to construct another chat message handler. So just another reminder, because it's incredibly important for Mediator, it's not maintaining state in the handler. We have to have that state somewhere else if we truly require state. And in this silly example, yeah, we do need some state. If you're communicating between different services and things like that, you may not need it the same way here. From there, we enter the message handler once again, and we can see that user two and three are getting a message from user one. And finally, we exit the message handler. All right, and that's gonna wrap up the mediator pattern using mediator. We saw that we had to use the service collections so of the dependency injection framework that Microsoft has to register our handler, as well as pull out the mediator and the handler that we registered. And we did need to have something else in our example to maintain state. That was that user registrar that we looked at. Once we added users to that and started sending messages that went through the mediator, that handler implementation was able to use the registrar to get the users and then have them receive the message on their own method call. Again, the important call out for this video and for the mediator pattern is effectively that the things that wanna communicate with each other the chat users in this case, don't have to know anything about the implementation of the receiver. All they know is that they can communicate through this IE mediator and trust that they're giving it enough information for that message to get delivered. This can allow us to build really decoupled systems that have messaging involved, and that's a pretty awesome thing when you're building systems at scale. Now, I know you're a keen software developer, and you're thinking, because I know this is top of mind, that when we have code like this, how should we test it? Because that's what every software developer should be thinking, right? Should you be using unit tests for this, or should you be using functional tests? Well, if you're not really sure and you'd like an idea of where to start, you can check out this video next. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.